Today on Uncommon Sense, we'll talk to Maria Romine. She's an actress and the founder of Swords and Roses, which is a stage combat show. But today we're going to talk to her about something a little bit different. Stay tuned to find out. You are listening to Uncommon Sense, the official podcast of the Society of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. Uh, We're joined today with Maria Romine. Hi, Maria. How are you? I'm doing great, Gretelyn. Great, great to have you. And I'm here with my co-host as well, Albert Sines. Howdy, howdy. Uh, It's so great to have both of you here today. Um, As I said, Maria is an actress and she teaches stage combat. (laughs) Um, And that kind of ties in to what we're going to talk to her today, uh, because we're actually going to talk about a recent talk that she gave at the 41st Annual Chesterton Conference, which was on um, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So uh, kind of ties in, as I think you'll see, but it's it's a little bit different, but I um, that's her background. Anything you want to say about yourself, Maria, before we begin here? Please tell us about swords. I really want you to tell us all about swords. <laughs> <laughs> well, and 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 that love of chivalry. So that is something that I actually have in common with G.K. Chesterton is this love of chivalry, and uh, that's why I entitled uh, my talk as the knight and his late or the knight and his queen, is what I went with, uh, because of that idea of chivalry. But um, then I go a little bit deeper. So that's that's actually what I spoke about. But yeah, I love swords. And uh, so I also, I should have loved G.K. Chesterton a long time ago because he had a sword cane. And I, I still want to add that to my uh, my collection of weapons, but I, I haven't yet. <laughs> I uh, Albert and I used to work together in a, in a previous life and he could tell you I had a sword umbrella that lived at the office for quite a while. Um. <laughs> it was great. It was excellent. I, I felt like Gretlin was, had this hidden persona <laughs> Just whip out this sword at any point if she wanted. <laughs> but yes, sword, swords are, are absolutely spectacular. Um, maybe you can, I, I think Albert and I both unfortunately had to miss your talk, although we were both at the conference. Um, my baby would not let me attend and Albert had many, many duties. Uh, although I did help Maria get, get a laptop. I mean, that counts. Nice. It, she, she needed yes, the laptop. It, I got her that. He... He actually saved the whole thing because he offered the laptop and then I was able to actually get into my presentation. And so, and, and I never, ever use slides because my rule is if there is something that can go wrong, a slide will make it happen. Mm -hmm. But with this particular talk, I was focused on his uh, GK Chesterton's poetry and specifically the poetry of um, a dedicated to our lady. And so I had to use the slide projector. I had to use a computer and uh, I, I, with a lot of intercession and a lot of prayer, it, everything worked and, and it worked out swimmingly. So <laughs> some, some real life it on really the ground well. chivalry from, from Mr. Signs. Uh. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> he came to my rescue. <laughs> <laughs> He's good at that. Um, so even just, just uh, for me and, and Albert's sake, um, since we had to miss, you know, for, if you wouldn't mind giving us just a little rehash of your talk and maybe we can um, delve deeper from there. Sounds good. Uh, So what I focused on, because I knew that we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of G.K. Chesterton's conversion, um, my focus was on a little aspect of conversion, but also it was honestly the story, uh, I blended my story with uh, my conversion to loving G.K. Chesterton. Uh, with um, how he pulled me in and then also my quest after um, I encountered the love that G.K. Chesterton had for Our Lady of what I did with that. So um, just to give you a background, I um, traveled with Theater of the Word Incorporated. First, uh, I was a Protestant, a Presbyterian, but through the touring of uh, Theater of the Word, I encountered the beauty of the Catholic Church. And right away, I was introduced to G.K. Chesterton, whom I had never encountered until I started traveling. And I was actually cast in the role of the princess in the surprise. And uh, I really loved that role. And I actually thought when I was first learning the lines for the role, I went, G.K. Chesterton's not a bad writer of women's roles. (laughs) These monologues are superb. He's almost as good as George Bernard Shaw. (laughs) 
<laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did, I, you know, I did quite understand why, why, why the laughter when I first said that out loud, but that did happen. Uh, but I loved the role. And then I actually met Dale Alquist uh, through um, performing the surprise. We, uh, he came in the next weekend with Chuck Childberg and they taught, they had an evening at Chesterton. And that's really when I encountered the, the idea that he, uh, or a little more reinforced the idea of chivalry, but then I heard his witty, um, his witticisms, and I I thought, oh, wow, this is really he's a really interesting author. Uh, his fan base was what really surprised me. I thought, what is all this? These people <laughs> are so in love with this man. I mean, he's an author and he's good, but I mean, I assume he's good because his, his wit is really good, but come on. <laughs> and I kind of was like, all right. And, and some of his ideas were a little, a, a lot to handle when you're first introduced to him. And I, I kind of, as with a lot of people, you're going to laugh when I drew a line in the sand and I said, okay, GK Chesterton, you say on that side of the line and I'll stay on my side of the line. <laughs> And as we know, as a convert, as soon as you start drawing lines, that's usually when the door opens. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what does uh, C.S. Lewis say? Of the, the the I know you weren't an atheist, but the young atheist has to can't be too careful about what he reads. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And, and uh, I actually went to my uh, I converted into the Catholic Church in uh, 2009, and then my first uh, G.K. Chesterton conference was in Seattle. And uh, that was in 2009. And I actually thought I'd give him a chance, you know, since I was be, had become Catholic. So I asked around, I said, what book should I get? And it was uh, a lot of people suggested the uh, Apostle of Common Sense. So I bought that book. I read it. And I became a fan of Dale Alquist writing because mm. I, <laughs> just said I couldn't, do. I couldn't. I could not jump off and, and actually tackle a Chesterton book. I just kept going, well, I don't know. I don't know. So I was kind of hemming and hawing. And then I was in uh, Kansas City, and I was invited to a Marian conference. And uh, Dale was at that Marian conference. And so I attended his talk on uh, Our Lady. Mm. I was really excited because I, I got to hear, I thought I thought I would be hearing Dale talk about <laughs> something other than G.K. Chesterton. What I was not... <laughs> that, that's, I know. That's I, funny. How naive. <laughs> how naive could you be? But I was not prepared for what I heard. Um, so, Jail, uh, at some point, reads a poem by G.K. Chesterton called A Little Litany. And I'd like to share that because uh, I think... He, uh, you sometimes uh, gather more when you hear it as opposed to just see it. Please. So I'm going to read, read it. It's a very short poem, but when God turned back eternity and was young, ancient of days grown little for your mirth, as under the low arch, the land is bright, peered through you gate of heaven and saw the earth or shutting out his shining skies a while built you about him for a house of gold to see pictured walls, his storied world, return upon him as a tale is told, or found his mirror there, the only glass, that would not break with that unbearable light, till in the co in a corner of the high dark house, God looked on God as ghosts meet in the night. Star of his morning, that unfallen star, in the strange starry overturn of space, when earth and sky changed places for an hour, and heaven looked upwards, in a human face, or young on your strong knees and lifted up, wisdom cried out whose voice is in the street, and more than twilight of twi-formed cherubim, made of his throne indeed a mercy seat. Arisen from play at your pale raiment's hymn, God grown adventurous from all time's repose, of your tall body climbed the ivory tower and kissed upon your mouth the mystic rose. Mm. I melted in my seat. Um, I am consecrated to Our Lady, which is a practice of devotion uh, to grow closer to our Lord. You get closer to your, his mom. And throughout that poem, because I prayed the litany of the Blessed Virgin, I heard all her nicknames mm -hmm. all, within the litany. And uh, I was just blown away by the fact that Chesterton was able to take a very 
big litany of our Blessed Virgin Mary and shrink it down into something very small and compact as this a little litany and incorporate several of her names within this poem. And I, I just fell in love with him and I said, oh my gosh, I, I want to know this man. Um, I want to know what inspired him to write a poem of so much love and and then this creed, this also with these same words, this picture of Jesus sitting on his mother's lap. And you can almost picture she's kind of cradling him in some ways so that the earth is actually bent over towards heaven. Mm. But yet I also had this image of him putting his hand on her face and looking into her eyes. And then Dale says this so well. He says, it was God looking at himself in his mother's eyes. Mm. Gorgeous. And that is something you could just take to adoration. For I mean, an hour. God looking yeah. at himself for an hour, yeah, at <laughs> least. And I did. I have taken this poem to adoration so many times because there's so much in here. Um, I I just fell in love with this, and because of that, I wanted to know more about this man of G.K. Chesterton. What made him love Our Lady and and write this poem? So that became my my quest, <laughs> and I started my quest by the very beginning, I thought, I'll, I'll get his autobiography. I didn't find a single bit <laughs> in that autobiography. So, the most frustrating autobiography asked, ever written. Oh, man. I was like, there was no clue whatsoever. And, but, you know, looking now at having read several autobiographies, that's actually typical. We're so close to the subject, we can't be honest with the author. Mm -hmm. um, I will say Joseph Pierce's book on wisdom and innocence is excellent because it's Joseph's love letter to Chesterton, but within it, you ca he, he actually gave me some clues mm -hmm. to go with. Um, but then uh, preparing for the speech, I had to really search. And I actually found my first nugget in The Everlasting Man. And he's talking about uh, it's a childhood memory. And that, that's typical of authors, too, is they place uh, within their writings uh, something that may have happened long ago. So then you get a sense of where they came from. So the, my speech actually is my quest, taking it in a chrono chronological order so that you can follow along and see, kind of see his de development. But from an early age, as, as a child, he... He remembered this uh, problem, this dispute at the Anglican Church over a statue of the Virgin and the Child because they thought it was too Catholic. <laughs> and I actually have that quote. And it's a very fascinating quote. And it's a very timely quote, um, especially what's going on in nowadays. So I, I'd like to read that because uh, it's just, sure. it, uh, it really makes you think. And it, obviously, this was his we, earliest impressions of Our Lady. Um, so after much controversy... They compromise by taking away the child. One would think that this was even more corrupted with Mariolatry, since, unless the mother was counted less dangerous when provide, deprived of a sort of weapon. But the practical difficulty is also a parable. You cannot chip away the statue of a mother from all around that of a newborn child. You cannot suspend the newborn child in midair. Indeed, you cannot really have a statue of a newborn child at all. Similarly, you cannot suspend the ideas or the idea of a newborn child in the void or think of him without thinking of his mother. You cannot visit the child without visiting the mother. You cannot in common human life approach the child except through the mother. If we are to think of Christ in this aspect at all, the other idea follows as it is followed in history. We must admit, if only as we admit it in an old picture, that those holy heads are too near together for the halos not to mingle and cross. Mm. I love the, the end of that. That's so cool. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Mm. And that was his first impression uh, that we know of or that we've been able to, that I was able to track down. Uh, when he was 18, he traveled to Notre Dame. And I, I, from what I understand, he wasn't Anglican yet. He was kind of... I want to say, I don't want to say your typical 18 year old, but you can kind of <laughs> sense that spirituality <laughs> for an 18 year old young man out, out and about in Paris, but he toured Notre Dame Cathedral. And uh, if you have a chance to look at the artwork and the statues that were there, he was inspired to write a poem 
that then was featured in The Debater in 1893, the next year. And it's called Ave Maria. Mm. And it's a very lengthy poem. It's about prayer. Um, I, I I did read it at the conference, but I'm not going to read it because it is a long, lengthy prayer. <laughs> I, have, but I have a note to I look do... it up later, though. <laughs> <laughs> look it up later. Uh, it is beautiful and it is available for you to look at. And uh, it's, it's, again, one of those things you can really take to adoration and, and think about because it's so deep. And you're like, this is an 18 year old that really wasn't like tied to Our Lady or, or to his faith yet. But wow, it, it's really good. And you can already have a sense of what the Ballad of the White Horse is going to look like. Because mm. uh, there's even you, you will see some similar similarities in that. So um, from being an 18-year-old, he eventually does uh, come into the church and uh, he defends Our Lady as uh, a knight would. And it's actually featured in um, the book where A Little Litany is featured is a book called The Queen of the Seven Swords. Mm. Sword reference mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for it. I was like, she doesn't bring it up. The I'm going to have to. <laughs> yeah, no. When, so I, I, when I, I bothered and badgered Dale, I was like, where did a little litany come from? And he's like, well, it came from this book called The Queen of the Seven Swords. Mm. I love it. Mm. It's a great book. But he defends Our Lady in the poem just before A Little Litany. And it's uh, called A Party Question, where an atheist at the time kind of gives a dig at Chesterton. Uh, the atheist's name is uh, Arnold Lunn, and in his 1924 book, uh, Roman Converts, he makes a little jab at Our Lady. So then Chesterton responds with this poem and uh, <laughs> sings one back at, at Mr. Lunn. So that's called a party question, which is also found in Queen of the Seven Swords. Mm. And then um, we know that he visited Notre Dame, uh, Indiana uh, mm, at the mm -hmm. University in Indiana and uh, he just has this really uh, nice <laughs> kind thing to say about it and it, why he had to visit it it was he basically says the reason is the name of your university that name was quite sufficient as far as I was concerned it would not have mattered if it had been in the mountains of the moon wherever she has erected her pillars all men are at home and I knew I should not find strangers mm. Beautiful. I yeah. love it. Yeah, he is. He is just amazing. <laughs> he did write, um, besides poetry of, uh, about Our Lady, he also wrote in 1935, Mary. Um, uh, kind of, he actually gives a really good insight about uh, Mary and Mary and the convert. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, in that book. And it's, uh, it's just it's beautiful. I, I, I am one of these people where it's like, I have to read. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily with, luckily with Chesterton, there's always more. So <laughs> there's always more. And, and I, and to me, this, this just kind of, this is true also of a convert. You struggle mm. and she is one of the hardest um, pillars to jump over. If you are struggling in, in your quest to possibly become Catholic, uh, she was definitely a hang up for me. It's interesting, uh, though, so, that, uh, that she wasn't, she seems like she wasn't a hang up for him. I feel like. Not necessarily. Yeah. And, and I wonder if part of it was his natural chivalry. Um, you know, he, he, his natural inclination is to defend a woman so he wouldn't join in the defamation that was kind of right. general, you know, in the, in the culture of the anti-Catholic culture that he might have been surrounded by. And, and he, you know, she's a beautiful lady um, and, and depicted in art as beautiful. And, and so, yeah, he wanted to defend her. Mm. Um, I, it, but you could definitely see his kind of struggle in this. <laughs> uh, and I'll just, I'll just, uh, there's just the part where he says, uh, <laughs> I never doubted that this figure was a figure of faith, that she embodied as a complete human being still only human all that this thing had to say to humanity. The instant I remembered the Catholic Church, I remembered her. Mm -hmm. When I tried to forget the Catholic Church, I tried to forget her. When I finally saw what was nobler than my fate, the freest and the hardest of all my acts of freedom, it was in front of a gilded and very gaudy little image of her in the port of Brendenzi that I promised the thing I would do 
if I return to my own land. Mm. So he even made this promise in front of the statue of Our Lady. I will, I will do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So yeah, it's just his, his conversion. Um, uh, or, and we know his conversion story. He wrote all, uh, what was uh, reading about his conversion uh, and hearing how some friends thought, you're not Catholic. <laughs> They thought he was. A lot of his audience members thought he was mm-hmm. because of how he wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I'm sure that his inclusion of Mary probably thought made people think of that. But uh, there were others that obviously were, were torn. But mm. uh, he he defended her all the time. Maria. Uh, um, and then I just. Yes, sir. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to interrupt. I, I just I've been thinking mm-hmm. about this as you've been talking so passionately about Chesterton and about Our Lady and about how you have sort of been influenced. And so I kind of, it's kind of a twofold question. My, my first question is, how would you say that Chesterton influenced your own relationship with Our Lady? Was he instrumental in forming that? Was he sort of a strengthening? Like, where where does that lie? Because a lot of people that come to Our Lady sort of naturally come to it through, you know, their own devotion or they hear about one of the apparitions. Oh, I went to Magigoria and now I, I, I'm all about it. I went, I went to Fatima. I went, you know, I went to Mexico City. You know, what, where is it for you, particularly in reference to Chesterton, what did he do for you in your relationship with, our, with, with the Blessed Mother? Uh, I would say that he has strengthened my love of Our Lady. Um, and then I see a, a brother at arms, you know, he, the fact he defends her. So I, I too want to defend her. Um, also just, um, he has such a great sense of beauty, the eye of beauty. Um, uh, so he's inspired me to, to write, which I never thought I would do again. <laughs> Uh, uh, he, um, he was at the, the poem, a little litany actually was what I used when I became the president of my, my parish's Legion of Mary. It's what I used to kind of uh, springboard into my presidency. And I said, I want all of you to take this poem and reflect on it. And, uh, just think about, you know, Jesus, um, and Mary and, and how a little toddler Jesus, it's God looking into looking at himself through his mother's eyes. And um, I actually have a funny story about that because uh, there was a guest at our meeting, my first meeting, and she ran out of the door oh. and came back with a portrait of the child toddler Jesus sit, sitting on his mother's lap with his little hand on her cheek looking in her eyes. And I was like, oh my gosh, she goes, I rescue religious items that are on for recycle. And she says, I stopped by and happened to pick this up on my way here. Wow. And I said, how? Yeah, I know. I'm providential for sure. And I was like, oh, this is such a beautiful portrait because you usually, when you see Mary and Jesus, they're faced out mm. looking at you. This is the two of them looking at each other. And I said, how much? You know, I'm getting ready to write a check or dig through my purse. And she's like, after your reflection on a little litany, it's not for sale. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you did too good of a job. <laughs> I, that was Chesterton's words. Yeah, he made it right. priceless. <laughs> he made it priceless. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, funny. man. <laughs> so I, I would, I, I actually, he, he's made me go on a quest for not only his spirituality and really wanting to know what his relationship was. And also just in regards to my spirituality, I would say really trying to express my love of Our Lady through poetry and through writing and then um, making sure that my my work as an artist is for good, truth, beauty, and goodness, which we're all called to do. Mm-hmm. So it's I would say that he's helped me refocus my purpose, really, as an artist. Would you say then, the other part of my question was, with such an inspiration to you and the way that he's impacted you and all the way through your, your art and through the things that you do in your daily life, do you think if you were to say, 
people who want a deeper relationship with Our Lady should read Chesterton. Do you think that's a fair statement? Oh, that's a very fair statement. And I, I really, um, I would like to badger Dale and say he really needs to print the Queen of the Seven Swords. Mm. Because I would certainly make sure that every Legion of Mary representative got one. Mm. They need to be converted. Actually, I do a pretty good job of talking up Chesterton, but it's better for them to see it in his own writing. But I, I yeah, if you want to, I feel like that book in particular is such a good book. But then uh, Nancy Brown, I went through all this work <laughs> to prepare for this script. And then Nancy Brown comes out with this book called G.K. Chesterton and Our Lady. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I, I'm like, I wouldn't have had to work so hard. <laughs> <coughs> All every poem that I pulled, every quote that I pulled is in this book. <laughs> so people could just go to Chesterton.org and get Nancy Carpenter Brown's book on the essays and readings of G.K. Chesterton and Our Lady. Pick it up. And this actually... Is, is that little uh, staple until Dale gets the other one out. <laughs> Amen. We, we've, uh, we've had the pleasure of talking to Nancy about that book. And uh, it's so funny because as you're talking, I'm like, I, it's all in Nancy's book. But it came out it just, just ev- probably a little bit too late <laughs> for you to it's use it. At, yeah, too late for me to do the research. Yeah. Great for her. <laughs> yes. Well, that's a good moment then, uh, just to clarify that URL. For anyone who does want to uh, reference that book for themselves and add it to their own library, again, that is G.K. Chesterton and Our Lady by Nancy Brown. It's a collection of essays and readings on Chesterton's spiritual life, and you can get that at chesterton.org forward slash store. Again, that's chesterton.org forward slash store uh, to... Uh, take a look at and hopefully purchase G.K. Chesterton and Our Lady. And now back to the podcast. Thank you, Albert. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just, just brilliant. Uh, really enjoying this conversation. I'm wondering, though, a little bit um, if we can get a little bit personal for a moment. Uh, I think we have a little bit more time sure. left. Um, just interested in your own sort of hurdles with Our Lady and how you got over that, um, you know, in in your conversion. Uh, and then, you know, how kind of following up on Albert's question, like how that strengthened your, how Chesterton strengthened your relationship with her. Sure. Um, so um, as I mentioned uh, briefly, uh, she was a, a small stumbling block for me. But ironically, and I, I actually was interviewed on the journey home, so uh, <laughs> you'll catch it that uh, I went. I, I really thought I'm going to come. I was at EWTN, and I thought, oh, I'll buy my last. I'll buy a rosary from EWTN, so that when I make the announcement that I'm becoming Catholic, it will be you know just that magical moment. And I <laughs> walked in the gift store, and not a single one of them really called to me. And I I actually because I'm a weak person. I stepped out of there and I went, well, God, I know these two weeks have been really awesome, but I think I misread the whole thing. Sorry about that. I was really kind of like, see ya. And <laughs> this uh, a gentleman who's one of his sons is uh, uh, now a, a priest there came up to me at that moment and he said, oh, Marie, I'm so glad I ran into you. I make rosaries. This one's for you. <laughs> so at that moment, I was like, oof. All right. And uh, so that that was my honestly the lasso into the church. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, once I uh, came in to the church, I uh, I kind of put her off to the side. I was like, she's a beautiful lady. I recognize that she's Christ's mother. I can respect her. And I but I'm going to just kind of put her off to the side because she she was also I, I, I would call her a dangerous beauty because <laughs> she's de- <laughs> it's just a little too intimidating, too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> intimidating. And I I was uh, actually in the chapel one time and I I said, Lord, I want to grow closer to you. I love you so much. And it was about a year after I come in and, and he says, um, I want no my father and my mother. Mm. So I being the weak person I am, I said, okay, God, the father, let's go, you know? <laughs> and of course I, uh, ended up, uh, getting turned towards a consecration to Jesus through Mary. And that's a, a, a devotion that one of the actors I was traveling with through theater of the word had, uh, practiced. And he said, uh, 
there's some suffering involved and I'm a weak person and I, I don't sign up. But <laughs> I jokingly say I don't sign up for suffering, but I, I have learned the value of suffering, becoming a Catholic and, and the redemptive value of it. But at that time, I was like, ooh, I'm not going to sign up for that. <laughs> but then um, <laughs> I was at La Crosse, Wisconsin at that shrine. And this woman came up to me and I was just praying And this first thing out of her mouth was, are you consecrated to Our Lady? And I was like, no, <laughs> I understand that there's suffering that's involved. I don't do that jokingly, but not so much. Uh, then the next week I was at the Chesterton Conference in Emmitsburg mm. and this woman came up to our table and she says, point blank, are you consecrated to Our Lady? And I was like, no. <laughs> There's suffering involved. Did you not hear me? Yeah. There is suffering. I don't I, do this. But Mary was coming to get I you. I don't do it. Yeah, she was coming to get you. So the next week, I'm in Wichita, Kansas. I'm praying in the chapel. And this woman comes up and she goes, are you consecrated to Our Lady? And I'm like, no. <laughs> But I guess I might as well look into this because she's not going to leave me alone. It doesn't matter where in the United States I am. She's out for me. But uh, I, I uh, am very happy that I went on that journey uh, because it has been a, a, a chance for me to grow. And uh, I do it. I now walk with other people that, that do it. I say you shouldn't walk alone on, on a journey mm -hmm. like that. It, you know, you do grow closer to our Lord and you need a prayer warrior with you. Uh, but with that love of Our Lady, then really encountering Chesterton and walk, trying to find his love for Our Lady and then finding it in his different writings, um, that just shores me up that this brilliant man who has, is witty and intelligent, has this love of chivalry and swords, also has this honor and respect and awe for women. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the, the poetry uh, um, that he, he provides, it's, it's good meat for prayer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that's kind of my journey and, and then how Chesterton has kind of shored me up and, and kept, be, kept feeding me. And it's, it's funny how you realize, you know, there's suffering involved, but like, you know, you don't have to sign up. Suffering's coming anyway, right? So, <laughs> um, so you could kind of choose to do it with Mary or not. So, you know, maybe she was just coming for you to just be there for you. Yes, yes. And, and you know, she certainly suffered at the foot of the cross. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, not, I mean, she was, she was sharing in that suffering of our Lord, obviously in a different way, but uh, she... She really both, uh, yeah, it, I feel like the church is so good about teaching the redemptive uh, use of suffering because you can unite any, any hurt, any wound to our Lord because he understands completely. Mm. And, um, and it suddenly has meaning I, I, where it didn't before. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. I'm so thankful for that. Mm. Maria, I've so got I'm a, thankful. I've got a final Question. I know we're getting close to the end here, but before uh, sign off, here's my question for you personally: What is the greatest thing that Our Lady does for you in in your life? Because I think you hear a lot of people say, "Oh, like she helps me through this. Our Lady gets me through this. Our Our Lady is the reason that I can accomplish this." You know, all all the litany of reasons. Okay, for you. Who is Our Lady to you? Like, she is this in your life. Oh. <laughs> oh, the big question. She is. Albert asks, yeah, Albert it is. Asks it's the a hard huge. Numbers. He does. <laughs> he does, but uh, it's, they're good questions. Um, I. She's a comforter because uh, huh, she certainly knows about suffering. <laughs> um, she has definitely pushed me out of my comfort zone, but it hasn't been with the there you go and she leaves you she leaves you she's right there um that 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 uh, quote of saying that she puts her her mantle around you is very true mm -hmm. she's right there nudging you i would say it's sometimes it's a push but it's it's more of a nudge a motherly nudge i think that's why she's depicted a lot of times with her hands out not only is it our grace is pouring out of her hands gifts from god but 
but also that as a mother, she's just gently nudging you forward out of your comfort zone to, to do God's will. Mm. And, and, she, you know, she doesn't say a lot in, in the Bible, but what she does say is very, very powerful. And one of the things she says is do whatever he tells you. So good luck yeah. with that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're all trying to do that one. <laughs> we are. <laughs> And she just kind of nudges you along. <laughs> I just think it's it's so important to sort of establish for people that are so in love with Our Lady to share those sorts of examples, because I think a lot of people, even some devout Catholics, are still trying to find their relationship with Our Lady. They're trying to figure it out. Where, where does she fit in? How can she be a part of my life in a bigger way? You know, I, I think it was JP, too, who was very clear about, you know, you want to get to Jesus go through, go, go through mom, you know, uh, you know, so, Mm -hmm. you know, we all need to sort of find that and not sort of put her off to the side as the way you kind of said you did when you first came in. Oh, well, she's a nice lady. I respect her, but that's not enough for us as Catholics, right? We really need her in a very prominent position, but it's not going to be the same for every person. So I just wanted to, you know, how is it for, for you so that people could say, okay, well, Maybe I need to work a little more on trying to find where Our Lady fits into my own life. Exactly. And you, you want, if you want to know Our Lord better, you learn, you do have to meet the parents. And, <laughs> you know, God our Father is a, his own, you know, that, that's a hard thing. Uh, or, but it, it's also, in some ways, it's an easier relationship because we were introduced to that and, and and there are not so many stumbling blocks. But with Our Lady, she is a, our mother, but... Uh, I, I I would say also the consecration really helped me on that. It, Louis de Montfort's writings are are beautiful, and the idea that you know if you're going to approach the king, wouldn't you want somebody beloved to approach him on your behalf? Mm. I mean, not that you don't have the good merits and the the wit to stand before the king. We're all going to have to stand before them, but I would love to have Our Lady standing next to me, saying, "Well, she as your your holy advocate." Mm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Saying, <laughs> so, well, she did all this, and and uh, he gives this great image of how a peasant would give, um, who wants to give a present to the king, and it's a, just a an apple, and how if you give it to the uh, the queen mother to give to the king, she first cleans it up, and then she puts it on a golden platter, and then brings it to the king, mm-hmm. and the king is pleased because it's not only in the presentation, but it's who brings it to him. Beautiful. And so that's what she's doing. She's inter- she's interceding. We ask everybody to pray for us. But think about this: you're asking his mother to pray for you. Mm-hmm. You know who's not going to listen to mom? <laughs> <laughs> excellent you know, point. Excellent, mm-hmm. excellent point. Beautiful. Well, yeah. um, thank you so very much for coming on and talking to us, Maria. Uh, that was a wonderful, uh, wonderful little insight into the your talk that we both missed. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm glad I got a little bit of it right here. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, uh, remember, if you want to pick up Nancy Brown's book and experience a lot of um, the wonderful poems and writings that Maria read for us today, um, her book is called G.K. Chesterton and Our Lady, and it's available at chesterton.org forward slash store. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Albert, for joining us as well. Um, it's been great to have you both on. And remember, Chesterton is always better with friends. Thanks so much. See you next time. Mm-hmm.